Welcome to the Uncharted Podcast. I am your host, Inez Franklin. My hope for you today is that we discover faith beyond the boundaries. Uncharted is intended to be a safe place for you to listen, learn, and challenge yourself along your journey of faith. May grace and peace be with you today. Welcome to the show. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Uncharted with Ines Franklin. Today, I am so excited to share with you that the audiobook of Uncharted is now available on Amazon. So you can go and purchase it if you prefer to listen to a book rather than read it, or you like to do both. I, I tend to do both. I sometimes listen, I sometimes read. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the audiobook and show you a clip of it today as part of this podcast. But before I do, I want to share about a particular um, statement or phrase that I use in my book a number of times and explain it a little bit further for you. So in my book, I talk about this idea of active surrender. Now, we all know that as Christians, we are to surrender our problems to the Lord, to release this sense of control that we want to have to God, who is sovereign over all. We tend to surrender things like our finances, right? Our children, our family or relational struggles, uh, maybe a problem we're trying to solve, a health issue, etc. And that is all good and biblical because we do have a loving God who says we can trust him with whatever is happening in our lives. And when we get overwhelmed, he is not. He has infinite wisdom and we can surrender things to him. We can give it up to God. Uh, Surrender is also this idea of yielding and giving in or submitting to. And of course, submitting to the Lord, following Jesus as he calls us to, it's a way of submitting ourselves or yielding yielding ourselves to him. Uh, Anytime that we um, give in from perhaps our pride or selfishness or, again, our sense of control, our desire for certainty, and we say, God, we're going to give that up and trust you, that's surrendering. So surrendering is good. We talk about it, we sing about it, and all that is good. In my book, however, I talk about active surrender. Now, that's a term that as I've shared it, some people hear it this way. They hear, okay, so I should be actively surrendering. In other words, doing it all the time. Yes, that's a good way to listen to that term because yes, we should be always dependent on the Lord every single day. I think it's the most peaceful way to live when we are not surrendering everything to God. It means we're carrying the load fully and much of what happens in our lives is often way beyond our ability, our wisdom, or our experience. So nothing wrong with saying, I'm going to just try to live in a constant state of surrendering to the Lord, a daily surrender. You've heard that, right? A minute by minute surrender, singing the song, right? I, I lift up my hands, Lord. I surrender to you, surrender all. But what I meant by active surrender in my book was a little bit different, so I want to explain it. Uh, To me, surrendering, again, is a passive uh, posture, is when we give something up, we yield it, we give in, we submit. To be active, however, is to initiate, to move, to be active, to work or function, to operate. And what I mean by this is that oftentimes we say, I will surrender to God, and again, not a bad thing. But we take on this passive uh, posture, which means, well, I won't make a decision. I won't move on this until I hear from the Lord or until God does something. Sometimes that is appropriate because we've reached the end of our rope. However, there are times when we have steps we can take, but we don't want to take them. And it, we just surrender it to God and say, okay, God, you do this. You move that door. You deal with that relationship. I've, I, I can't deal with it. When maybe there is something we can do. So when I say active surrender, I'm saying, hey, sometimes we need to perhaps do the steps that we know we can do. And also 
perhaps the steps that God is calling us to do. Uh, I'll tell you a story. So when my husband Jim and I first got married, um, we let me just give you some background. We are um, a blended family. We have five children together. He came with two daughters. I came with a son and two daughters. This was my third marriage, third and last. This one I'm doing with the Lord, actively surrendering to him. And uh, so I believe this is it. But I tell you, our marriage started with some challenges because we were a blended family and we have also blended grandchildren. So complicated upon complicated. And within two years of our marriage, we were struggling pretty quickly. You know, the statistics of marriages that survive after the first uh, divorce are pretty low. And then you have two divorces, it gets even lower. And then if you've heard my story, and I hope you have, if you haven't, you can, you can go to my website at inesfranklin.com onto the about page. There's a good video there that tells you about my story. If you don't, it's also included in the book. You will definitely know more about me than you probably care to know. But um, basically, I we entered into our relationship in an adultery, in, a, in an affair. So our situation was really messy, and that reduces the chances of a marriage making it. And so the second year of our marriage, we were in struggle, and we got into a fight over something so silly. It was a mat in the kitchen that I had bought to dry our dishes, and the idea I had was that at least the counter wouldn't be all wet from the dishes drying. So you wash the dishes, put it on the mat, dry the dishes, put them away. So the mat would sit there with nothing on it unless you needed it. Well, my husband was using it a little bit differently than I would. He washed dishes and left them on the mat. And every time I walk by, I'm thinking, who's going to put those dishes away? They're just sitting there for like a long time. And one time I decided, well, I bought the mats and maybe I created for myself a problem. After sharing a few times my desire that we would use it my way, which was to put away the dishes after we washed them and not succeeding because still they were being left there. One day I decided to hide all the mats. And my husband asked me, what happened to the mats? And I said, well, I I put them away because they're not being used properly. And I bought them for a purpose and I don't like how they're being used. And we got into a whole discussion and ended up in a big old fight, like a big fight. And I went to my room and I realized, like, I started praying, going, God, our marriage is, this is so hard. I've been married multiple times before. And maybe, maybe this is going to be like another sign that I can't, that I can't do this, that I I don't know how to love. I, I actually said to the Lord, I said, Lord, Obviously, I'm the problem. This is my third marriage. Obviously, I have, I've, I don't know how to love people. You're going to have to teach me how to love the way that you love. I was a brand new Christian, maybe only two years into my faith, but I knew to ask that. And I said, Lord, how do I love him? Teach me how to love him the way you love him. Teach me how to see him the way that you see him. And as I was praying this, I felt the Lord kind of whispering to my soul saying, go and ask for forgiveness, go and um, apologize. And of course, my first thought was like, no. So here I started out with surrender. Not a bad job, right? I went to the Lord instead of yelling at Jim some more, went upstairs, went in prayer. I get points for that. But immediately upon hearing or getting a sense for what the Lord is calling me to do, I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not a good idea. That's not a good idea, God, frankly. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. Those were my mats I bought, and he wasn't using them the way I intended. And I know it sounds sort of sacrilegious, but that was exactly my conversation with God. And um, I sensed the Lord sort of prompting in my mind. And I know it was him because I would not think this way. It really interrupted my thoughts, which was, well, didn't you just ask me to teach you to love him the way that I do? Ooh. So then I had to shift from surrendering my problem to God to active surrender, which meant to surrender it and then act upon what the Lord was calling me to do. And he didn't just ask me to go and ask him for forgiveness. He asked me to go and get on my knees and put my hand on on him, like on his knee or something, as I said, I'm sorry. And I'm telling you, that was like dangerous things for God to ask. Because I'm a Puerto Rican. When I get upset, it's dangerous if you touch me. And I thought, oh, God, that is a, a bad idea. There is no way I can do this. And there's no way this is going to go out well. But again, I sensed the Lord pressing upon me to go and do it. And I did And I tell you, when I did do that, not only did I learn to be obedient, even when I didn't understand, or I didn't like what God was asking me to do, or I didn't really see the fruit of it, 
or even I felt like I was doing something, I was apologizing for something I didn't think I did wrong. Not only did I learn to be obedient and watch God work, but also it said something to Jim to see his wife behave totally different than I had so far in our marriage. And it was a turning point in our marriage. And so I remember that day realizing, wow, um, as a believer, there will be many times where I will be asked to do something by the Lord that I don't want to do, but it's the right thing to do. And it's consistent with his word. Of course, Jesus calls us to be forgiving people because he forgave us. So he's not going to ask us to do something that's going to be contrary to what he speaks to us in scripture. But when it is consistent, and we know in our guts that it's the right thing, but we don't act on it, I don't know that that's surrender. That's passivity. That's saying, God, you handle it. You, you deal with my husband down there because, you know, he's not being very nice, for example. That's being passive. That's surrendering, but in a passive way. And God calls us to act of surrender, to really trust him and accepting that he will sustain us with the gift of his presence and his faithfulness. And then we can then act on what we know. We can take one step. Sometimes that's all we know. Okay, I know the next step to take, but I don't know anything on the other side of this. Or maybe two or three steps, but we keep moving until the Lord says, stop. And there are a lot of times where it's clear that the Lord's saying, okay, don't go any further. Or we don't really have any steps whatsoever. And then we just do sit and wait on the Lord. Maybe God is now the one moving and we're not the ones moving. So in my book, I talk about active surrender. I hope that helps you a little bit as you uh, read into it. And so... Now, I want to play for you about five minutes, almost five minutes of the audiobook. Uh, Again, I recorded it together with uh, John Townsend recorded his forward, which is really fun. So what I'm playing for you right now is the beginning of the book, which is my reading in chapter one. And uh, I want to share with you that when I did this, this was the first time I've ever recorded a book. It took me three and a half days to do so in a studio. My mouth got dry. I had to stop and walk outside a few times. Many times I got in a cadence and he had to have me re-record things. It was a hard thing to do. Uh, But I felt really moved to give my voice to my book. And I pray that if uh, you are one of those people, if you're listening to a podcast, maybe you are, that you prefer to hear someone's voice. I pray that you will enjoy listening to the book and are nourished uh, by what God gave me to share with you. There's a lot of scripture in my book, a lot of encouraging stories from the Bible and my testimony and the testimony of others of God's good, loving kindness. Now, as you listen to the audio of the book, you're going to notice a slight difference in the sound of our podcast and the audio of the book. And that's because we're in different places and it's engineered by different teams. But I did want you to listen to the original book as it's going to sound when you purchase it on Amazon. It was wonderfully done. And I hope it gives you a taste and you want to go and get it. You just have to go to Amazon, pick it up. It's Uncharted, Navigating Your Unique Journey of Faith. You will find it on Kindle version, printed form, and of course, Audible. And if you read it or listen to it, I would so appreciate it if you would come back to Amazon and leave a review or on Goodreads, that works as well, and that others could consider your voice as they look at the book as a possibility for them to read. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Enjoy these few minutes from the Uncharted book, and may the peace and grace of Jesus Christ be with you today and all week long. God bless you. Section 1. Knowing God's Desires. Chapter 1. Seeing the Invisible. Knowing God's Desires for You. Oh my God, teach my heart where and how to seek you, where and how to find you. Teach me to seek you. I cannot seek you unless you teach me or find you unless you show yourself to me. Let me seek you in my desire. Let me desire you in my seeking. Let me find you by loving you. Let me love you when I find you. St. Anselm of Canterbury. The first time I heard about the creator of everything, of all that we see and cannot see, 
the birds of the air, fish in the sea, sun, planets, mountains, ants, and rain, all the animals and people, air, gravity, and love. I imagined a bearded older man dressed in a glowing white outfit and holding a magic wand, floating away in the dark universe. With my seven-year-old mind's eye, perhaps subconsciously avoiding divine authority, I drew small the Almighty God. The idea of an all-powerful God who is sovereign over everything was alarming. Already, I had deep scars from several obsessively controlling people in my life. I had a life-draining, deep-seated desire for certainty and control to shape outcomes and life events to my liking. But though I didn't know it, God was already offering me life-giving water from a deep well. The truth was that His authority held the key to peace. My sovereign God wanted me to seek, find, and know His good, perfect, and loving heart. And He would eventually open my eyes to see Him, revealing to me His good desires. I didn't know this. My desire for control hid it from me. But my Puerto Rican grandmother, my abuelita, she knew. Abuelita knew that in the human soul, there is a deep yearning that is satisfied only by the love of God. Her life was successful, but also tough. My abuelo, grandfather, ran a small construction company, farmed their land, and tended their cattle. From early morning to late at night, Abuelita helped him and took care of the household and children's needs. Their team effort and hard work paid off as they built their own beautiful home and had enough resources to be generous to others. Even so, as a matriarch of 13 children, Abuelita experienced a devastating loss of her first son, the terror of sending sons to war, and walked through many seasons of relational, financial, political, and health-related uncertainty. The many challenges she faced built her into a driven woman and a strong leader. She set lofty goals for herself and her family, and her determination helped her accomplish much. But sometimes, when others did not behave the way she wanted them, she became overly controlling, angry, frustrated, and disappointed. She knew God was in control and that His path was peace, but she too struggled to cope with uncertainty. I used to watch her from a distance as she trimmed her roses and prayed out loud, seeking God's help. The fact that she knew to reach out to God showed that despite her trust issues, she knew the right steps to take to find freedom from the fear that grips the control-obsessed human heart. Blinded by control. I come from a long line of control freaks. You do too. My sweet abuelita would say so. And if she were here, she'd point her shaky arthritic finger at each of us for emphasis. All of us like to have control, some of us more than others. We want things to happen as we expect them to, people to behave in a certain manner and life to function within our boundaries. We want our parents to be perfect, our spouses to know what we're thinking, our children to immediately do what we tell them, our boss to reward our accomplishment, and all manner of illnesses to skip right over us. We all crave certainty. It all started in a garden, the most beautiful and perfect garden ever to exist. Humanity was birthed in complete bliss and blessing, provided with everything needed for flourishing, joy, and peace, including an intimate, loving relationship and communion with the Creator. God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. He created men and women in his image, in his likeness, and set them on a mission with God-given authority. Then he planted a garden for humanity to enjoy walking in and working in with him. Thank you for listening to Uncharted Podcast with Inez Franklin. Learn more about Inez at unchartedpod.com. Follow Inez's journey on Instagram at Inez Franklin. Sign up for our email list to receive direct access to online experiences and more. Thanks for listening and join us again next time. Mm